This meeting is being recorded. Hello everyone and well oh sorry the music Hello everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar with the Action Against Something Hub my name is Alessia and I am the communications manager for the hub uh, today we are going to talk about uh, early childhood education systems with our education and cognition work stream um, after all the presentations, we're going to open to questions, so feel free to add your questions in the Q&A box, or if you feel brave, to raise your hand, and we're going to let you speak. Um, today's session is chaired by Dr. Benny Munoz, uh, who is part of the UCL Institute of, Institute of Education. So, Bernie, over to you. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much, Alicia. Uh, so yes, I'm Dr. Bernie Munoz, really pleased to be here. I'm a principal research fellow at the UCL Institute of Education, and I'm a researcher at the Education and Cognition Workstream at the IOE UCL. And welcome everyone to this webinar, Nurturing Children's Development, organized by the UK ARI GCRF Action Against, Against the Stunting Hub and the Education and Cognition Workstream at the IOE UCL with the country leads from India and Senegal. The UK ARI GCRF Action Against the Stunting Research Project investigates the multiple drivers of stunting in India, Indonesia and Senegal to inform evidence-based in intervention supporting child development. So today, uh, Thank you. If we look at our agenda, we have a very interesting presentation. First, Professor Ling Ang, who is a PI of this project from the UCL Institute of Education, uh, from the Cognition and Education Lead. She will provide us an overview of the Action Against the, the Stunting Project and Cognition and Education Workstream. Then Dr. Jessica Maisonnet, also at the UCL Institute of Education team, will present a, a profiling early childhood education in low and middle income countries. Specifically, she will be foc focusing on how we reviewed India and Senegal's early childhood education system. Then we will be, um, we have the pleasure to have Dr. Silvia Fernandez Rao who is from the National Institute of Nutrition from ICMR, Education and Cognition Lead in India. And she will be presenting a case study uh, uh, focusing on how the classroom observation grid from the Measuring Early Learning Environments or MELE was adapted and piloted in India. And then Professor Mustafani Diaye who is from the Service of Neurology uh, from the Université of Czech and Top Diop, um, from the Education and Cognition Co-Lead in Senegal, will be presenting also a case study uh, focusing on how the, class, the classroom observation, MELE, was adapted and piloted in Senegal. And finally, uh, I will lead uh, the discussion. We have 15 minutes to hear your perspectives, comments, and questions. So very happy to, um, to hear your views at the end of the sem seminar. So thank you so much. And over to you, uh, Professor Ling Ang. Thank you very much, Bernie. Um, so hello, everyone. I'm really pleased to be here and to be part of this um, session and to join my fellow colleagues um, from 
the UK um, UCL Institute of Education team, and also importantly, our country colleagues from India and Senegal, um, and my co PI, Professor Julie Dockrell. Um, it's really nice to meet all of you. Um, I will give a very brief overview of our study um, to start our session. Um, and you know, I think it's important to give a brief background in terms of thinking about the global context. Um, the World Health Organization, for instance, talks about how stunting, it's a global challenge. It affects more than 100 million children under five worldwide, mainly in low and middle income countries. And this, I hope, gives us gives you also a sense of the extent and the scale of the challenge that we are facing as a global community. Um, and stunting is a condition which um, refers to the impediment of a child's physical growth and development. And it's, of course, you know, as many of you may know, it's the result of severe malnutrition, um, poor diet, um, and also, you know, it is also an outcome of structural inequalities, you know, like inadequate health provision, social economic inequalities, and so on. So it is a very key stark global challenge that we are all trying to address in our project. So to address this challenge, our project the UK Cognition um, and Education work stream of the UKRI um, GCRF Research Stunting Research Hub. What we are hoping to do, what our project is about, is about investigating the cognitive profiles, learning needs, and educational environments of children who are stunted and non-stunted in three key study sites, um, Senegal, India, and Indonesia. And what we hope to achieve is to inform an evidence-based intervention to support children's development and early learning. And we are working across two main studies, a main cohort of 500 pregnant mothers um, and their children in each country, and also a preschool cohort um, using a representative sample of early year settings and children at preschool age, three to five years. And this is the main cohort um, of which this workshop will be focusing on. And what we hope to do is to capture learning opportunities, um, and development of the children um, in a representative sample of early years environments. So to start with, um, what we did was to identify reliable, valid and culturally sensitive measures um, to, you know, to decide you know, how are we going to measure the quality of those learning environments. Um, and we undertook um, a systematic review led by Dr. Bernie Munoz, um, which whom we have met, in consultation, of course, with our important country colleagues on this call, um, to identify the appropriate tools and measures for assessing children's development and environment. And from this review, um, we identified MELE, which is the Measuring Early Learning Environments tool that we will use to observe and access, um, sorry, assess the educational environments. So we decided on the, on the melee on using this tool for various reasons, because we know it's a tool that is internationally recognized. It has been well validated and reliable in different country contexts, uh, particularly in the countries that we are working with. Um, and the melee essentially is an observation tool that is structured around four key domains. Um, you can see that on the slides and those key areas are pedagogy and learning activities. We look at also the interactions, the children's interactions in the classroom and approaches to learning, the classroom arrangements, the more physical environment, the space and materials, um, the facilities um, and the safety elements of the learning environment. And to complement the work around capturing the quality of the learning environments, we also plan to conduct qualitative interviews with teachers to really understand from their perspective what a quality learning environment would look like and their role in supporting children's learning. So in brief, our overarching goal as, as a team um, is that you know, we hope our research will help to better to help us better understand what are the educational features that characterize the quality um, environment, what particularly learning needs, for instance, that children experience um, for those who are stunted and also those who are not stunted, um, and how can the earliest environment, which we know is a very important um, indicator and characteristic of supporting learning, what how can the early years environment be enhanced to better support children's learning um, and ultimately improve the educational outcomes. So I'm really pleased um, to you know, share with you the study today. Um, and I'd like to pass over now to Dr. J Jessica 
um, Masoni, who will talk you through some of the very interesting work that we've done in terms of mapping early education systems um, in the three countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Lin Ang. So I will tell you a bit more now about how we um, um, understood the uh, early childhood education systems across the three countries. So um, we, we've told you before that we're working across three countries, India, Indonesia, and Senegal. And in order to um, visit the classroom and observe the classroom, it was first very important to have a sense of um, the early childhood education system in each country so that we understand what types of settings exist and that we draw a representative sample of schools, preschools to uh, observe. So our protocol um, uh, has been submitted uh, to the journal Comparative Education and we have developed it um, in collaboration with um, the uh, research and country leads in India, Indonesia uh, and Senegal. So I will, um, share my screen in a different way because um, I will show you an infographic that we have uh, created to um, summarize our protocol. So I will get back. So that's the infographic. I will just share my screen and the slideshow. Here we go, so that you can see better. Um, so this is our infographic. So this is our infographic, and basically, when we profile early childhood education systems, we ask four main questions. First, we ask what types of early childhood education settings exist um, in the countries, uh, and drawing on uh, existing literature, we um, uh, differentiated between three categories of settings: settings that are defined as formal because they are recognized by the government and have a structured curriculum. So in the case um, of the United Kingdom, that would be public preschools with the official governmental curriculum. And I will give examples, of course, of formal settings in India and in Senegal in a minute. Um, and these formal settings are different from non-formal settings, which are um, not recognized by the government, but have a defined preschool curriculum. So that would be the case for private preschools. And finally, informal settings are not recognized by the government um, and don't have a formal uh, written curriculum. So that would be the case, for example, for a toddler group that is organized by parents in the neighborhood. And for uh, each type of setting that we reference, we uh, collected information about um, its religious orientation, if there is any religious orientation, uh, its source of funding, ma the management system, where um, the setting was located, if it was more in urban rural areas, its physical characteristics, the opening hours to get a sense of how long children could spend in the settings, whether they offered uh, health, and nutrition, health and nutrition services, because these are elements of um, early childhood education quality as per international standards. And, um, and we ask what were the ages served and what was the average uh, pupil and teacher ratio. So this is to get a sense of the uh, structures um, that are in place in the countries. Next, we wanted to understand who accesses the settings because once they exist, we need to have a better understanding of who is attending them. And for that, we had a look at the enrollment proportion, whether it was different between male and female, uh, whether it was different for children uh, of different ages, and whether there were any uh, barriers to accessibility to the setting. So for example, the distance from home, the presence of conflict, seasons, so when there are heavy rains can be more difficult for the children to attend, or any documents that the families might uh, have to present that could be difficult to uh, access, such as birth certificates. So we refer referenced the cost for parents and carers, if there are any. And importantly, uh, we reviewed information about the inclusivity of the settings in terms of children's language, their socioeconomic background, their ethnicity, religion, caste, and special needs. The third question we asked was about the profile of teachers. So who are the adults present in the settings? Are they professional teachers? Are they assistants, parents? And what was the initial 
training in terms of uh, content and length. Um, we also uh, reviewed whether they benefited from any support while they were in service. And uh, importantly, we considered whether parents and children had a voice in framing learning opportunities in the setting, because we know that all these factors impact the learning experience of the children. And finally, we kept in mind the broader standards and policies which frame early childhood education. So any standards and laws which define what early childhood education environment should look like and which define the curriculum um, and any monitoring system in place, such as, uh, for example, the collection of assessments with children. So these are lots of questions. And to um, address these questions, we work with I'm going to unzoom now because that's going to be a very big slide. We worked with everyone on the team to review um, um, the literature. So each country needs. So uh, Risa, uh, Dr. Risa Kolopeking in yes, Indonesia. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, our audience is asking if you could put the slides in the slideshow because they can't really see them. Okay. Is it better now? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, so each country uh, lead, Dr. Riza Kolopeking in Indonesia, Professor Mustafa Ndiaye in Senegal, and Dr. Silvia Fernandez in India, uh, have uh, collected the uh, key national standards and policies which are framing early child education systems uh, in their respective countries. Uh, and Dr. Bernie Munoz and myself uh, complemented this search with um, a review, um, a documentary analysis of the documents um, uh, in English and French. Um, but the documents importantly accessed by each of our country leads were um, in uh, both English and the nat national and regional languages. So we collected 53 documents in total. Um, and we uh, designed an infographic per country to represent the early childhood education system of each country. I'm wondering how I can show them um, in an easy way, Alicia, because if I stop sharing, will that be the same problem as before? You maybe you should stop sharing, but then zoom really in, so. Okay, let's try. So I will focus on India and uh, Senegal. I will zoom a lot. How is it now? Is that big enough? A bit more. Okay, I think like this is fine. If if you if you can see it, please let us know in the chat. So um, in India, the gross enrollment rate is at sixty three percent. So I will read through the main information, um, so that if you don't see clearly what is written, it's alright because it's a lot of information in the screen. And in Indonesia, in India, uh, we have two main types of early childhood education settings, which are the Nganwadi centers, which are um, supported and recognized by the uh, government um, and which welcome children um, from their birth to six years of age. Actually, they welcome also pregnant mothers and teenage girls. Um, and there is these settings adopt a holistic approach to child development, including nutrition, health, um, education and an education component for children between three and six. Um, the second type of um, setting that is prevalent in India are private preschools. And um, for these, um, there is a big variability in the educational approaches. The children that are welcome are mainly between four and five years of age. Um, and uh, basically, the pedagogical approaches um, are not necessarily holistic, so they, they, they can focus more on preparation to primary schools. So, uh, Sylvia will be able um, to talk more about the, um, her context um, in a moment. Um, and um, in India, we've referenced the percentage of people, of children accessing the settings, and we, uh, we were aware that the location of the setting and parental uh, educational background and socioeconomic status was conditioning whether children attended preschool and what type of preschools they were attending. And in Senegal, um, we reference up to six um, types of um, 
um, preschools. Importantly, the gross enrollment rate in Senegal was um, um, a bit lower than India. It was at 17.8%. Um, so a lot of children stay at home or in the neighborhood. But among the different types of settings they could attend, there was a great uh, diversity. So um, I will hide, outline um, uh, briefly the setting. So um, there are preschool classes for children to prepare for primary school when they are between five and six years of age. So these are attached to primary schools. Um, and these are, are formal, so um, recognized by the government. You also have um, formal nurseries and kindergarten, which are inspired by the French pedagogical objectives of preparing for primary school for children between three and six years of age. And you also have a different model, um, which is closer to this uh, holistic approach to child development. And this, this model is that of community preschools and children's huts, where the focus is on education, but also health and nutrition, um, and the, the, the really the holistic approach to child development. And finally, there are Quranic schools, which uh, are not all recognized by the government and that focus on religious um, education. So um, this is for the overall overview. So you can see that we, we have um, reviewed the diversity of settings, uh, but now I will um, hand over to Sylvia um, and uh, followed by Mustafa so they can really give you the, the experience of, of working in their respective countries. And I will get back to a slideshow. Over to you, Sylvia. Thank you, Jessica. And just I think you prefer to share your screen. Uh, right. I need a minute to share my slides. Yeah. Um, greetings to all. Um, I'll be sharing some of our observations and uh, uh, experience piloting the Malay here in India. So uh, the pilot was uh, primarily done to check if the tool and the adaptations that we made are feasible and culturally appropriate. There were not uh, many adaptations, very minor changes that were incorporated into the tool. And uh, for the pilot, we've um, observed four Anganwadis. You just heard Jessica about the government preschools uh, called Anganwadis. So, Four Anganwadis were included in our observations. And uh, we also uh, had another two observations separately to establish inter-rater reliability. So this melee was done uh, by two assessors, myself and my colleague, uh, Ms. Sridevi. So each of these observations are for about two to two and a half hours. So that gives us ample time to uh, um, observe all the preschool activities that are done for noon, uh, followed by their uh, lunch, and uh, then it's the nap time. So uh, the preschools, these Anganwadis are also centers for supplementary nutrition. So the children are served uh, uh, morning, mid-morning snack and uh, lunch. So these meal times were also included in our uh, observation. And um, the current status uh, of the pilot is that it is completed. We also established inter-rater reliability and we've uh, initiated uh, data collection for the main study. However, we had to um, put it on hold for now because of the rising COVID cases and we are hoping to resume uh, soon. Yeah. Now coming to the observations uh, or during the melee, um, uh, Jessica just mentioned that the working hours are uh, 9 to 4.30 p.m. Uh, the Anganwadis have to function from 9, 9 to 4 uh, in the evening. However, the classes don't start uh, anytime before 10. So our observation, so we usually see uh, parents waiting for uh, the teacher to come in and it usually starts off sometime at around 10 to 10.30. But once the teacher comes in, um, uh, the children know the drill. They start off with the prayer and um, that is in English and uh, in Telugu, followed by a one hour, uh, the first session, I wouldn't call it one hour, but at least 45 minutes of a lot of singing activity, rhymes and singing. This includes a lot of themes like uh, they cover the alphabet song and the number song. They also have stories uh, in a sing song uh, method where uh, 
moral values like sharing and uh, helping each other. These kind of stories are also sung. Um, this is a one group activity uh, led by the teacher and it is um, highly engaging and energetic. So after this activity, they kind of move on to their mid morning snack followed by uh, writing activities. So here for us, the uh, tools for writing is usually the slate and uh, slate pencil very uh, for it's only for drawings that they use books but for practicing writing skills it is usually the slate for this age group and um, this activity is very child specific the teacher is very mindful of the child's age and uh, tasks uh, the each child accordingly so usually she writes um, uh, alphabet a letter on the slate and then the child uh, draws over it and gets a lot of practice for the older children uh, she doesn't do that uh, she instructs them what to do and the children write by themselves so uh, in all the preschool activities we have uh, observed consistently that the oral activities uh, is all done in a combined fashion in a as a one group activity whereas the writing um, part or the writing activities are done on a child to child basis, uh, very specific to the child's uh, stage of uh, development. And uh, these are some of the classrooms. I'm sorry about the picture quality. Um, these are some of the classrooms and uh, why I'm specifically sharing this is because when we had our uh, discussions with the teachers about what they require uh, to improve uh, the conditions or uh, improve their uh, uh, preschools. What came up consistently was that uh, in uh, they need better infrastructure. They need good classrooms. Uh, they felt that the classrooms are very cramped and dingy and uh, these are urban centers. So outdoor space is uh, almost negligible in any of the centers. All these Anganwadis, they just open up onto the streets. So there's no uh, space for outdoor games. So it is uh, very important that the classrooms themselves be uh, large enough so that they can conduct all their activities uh, that they are supposed to. So here on the left, one of the classrooms that we uh, conducted the observation is uh, pretty uh, big, very spacious. That happens to be the community hall that was given to the Anganwadi centers. So in such cases, they are lucky and they uh, have a good classroom, but the others are rather dingy and congested and most of the time, difficult for the teacher to manage uh, to accommodate the children as well as do all her uh, activities so gross motor activities are usually you know, to the minimum because of the space restrictions and you can also see that these are the times even uh, the mothers the pregnant mothers walk into the anganwadi and then they uh, kind of um, uh, come in either for the registrations to register themselves because uh, the meal program is also for the mothers and um, this center had a timing for them to come in, that is the child's uh, lunchtime. But sometimes uh, mothers come in during the preschool activities also, and then there is a uh, uh, disruption of the preschool activities and the teacher has to attend to the uh, mothers. So that's about the classroom. And something new that has happened in these Anganwadis is uh, the online classes. So since the pandemic, uh, online classes have started so that the children don't lose in touch with what they have learned and um, that practice is continuing even now so now though the children come to the centers um, part of the session one session is done uh, online and uh, they use the mobile phone if you can see it here it's the teacher's mobile phone and the uh, children are sitting around it and they watch one lesson it could be anything it could be a story or number work or how to write uh, a, a new letter so any of these sessions are, are done online and then the teacher follows it up with discussion but our observation showed that most of the time it is just a one-way communication the follow-up part is lost and um, this picture here is from a rural setup uh, we haven't visited the center it's not part of the pilot but i just added this here to show that some of the ngos they adopt certain villages and then they provide them with uh, better infrastructure a more spacious classroom and uh, they have a big uh, screen TV. So these online classes are uh, more convenient in such cases rather than uh, here where they are watching it on the teacher's mobile, which is not optimum for uh, learning. Uh, 
Coming to the other facilities, uh, water was an important issue that was raised and uh, uh, all the Anganwadi centers are provided with the safe, clean drinking water. All, of, all the centers have access to drinking water. Uh, even if there is no tap connection in the center, it is provided by the neighbors or by the community. But all the centers have access to safe and clean drinking uh, water. Uh, coming to the toilet facilities, this is always an issue. Uh, there are some centers which have uh, uh, well-maintained toilets or uh, neat toilets, whereas the others are in need of repair and uh, not... Uh, um, not maintained because uh, of for various reasons and uh, small minor um, hazardous uh, uh, structures are also there within the Anganwadi like uh, a little rods popping up uh, from broken sinks and so on. This is this is just to say that there's a lot of variability in the centers uh, that we have seen. While some are neatly uh, kept as spacious, uh, others are uh, dingy and uh, in need of repair. Hand wash is uh, done uh, regularly since it also has the meal program. So before the lunch is served, all the children uh, line up and, and their hands are washed. And it is also always supervised by the uh, Aid. That is, the Anganwadi staff are uh, the teacher and she has an aide who kind of does the uh, serving uh, for children and uh, attends to their uh, uh, toileting and other needs as well. But what we've seen is the um, hand wash is always done only with water. <coughs> Sorry, soap is not used at any time. And this is my last slide. <coughs> Sorry, coming to the materials the education materials that are provided. This is uniform across all centers because um, this is provided by the system, by the department. So you have um, storybooks, you have, <coughs> I'm so sorry. You have storybooks, you have um, crayons, uh, art material, number blocks and all those things. But, and the children are all very enthusiastic, eager to learn. But what <coughs> I have observed is that um, there's a lot of material on what to do for the children, like in terms of content. Where we can really make a difference is on the delivery uh, method or how it needs to be delivered to the children stressing a lot on nurturance and uh, responsivity would be very crucial because that is the one thing which is not consistent and sometimes even missing. So in our centers here, <coughs> we can see that um, most of the time, because of these conditions, sometimes the children are um, cramped in a room and the numbers are more. Sometimes there's no aid and only the teacher manages. It's, it's a lot of, um, what do you say? A rough environment prevails and, <coughs> oh God. I have to excuse me, I'm so sorry. No worries, Silvia. My throat, yeah. I'm so sorry. But, but I have to stress this, that uh, our input for uh, the, preschools here in India, rather than what the teacher should do is uh, in guiding them on how to uh, do it. So if there is loads of nurturing and responsivity, <coughs> then um, it can go a long way in the learning and development because uh, we know that these are all children from low socioeconomic backgrounds and <coughs> who are exposed to quite severe environments um, within their community or homes. So the preschool can be a place where the difference can be uh, taught, like being more uh, nurturing, being more responsive, being more gentle with the students, um, with the children, because their enthusiasm and interest is all intact. And we've seen a lot of roughness, like it, it is not very culturally inappropriate for a teacher to smack the child on the back or even the ayah to smack the child uh, if they misbehave. So 
that kind of goes in as normal. So if we can bring about changes in that by uh, tuning into the more nurturing approach, that would be uh, very effective in the long run. Also, last point is the nap time is rather forced and it includes a lot of threats. In all these six centers, we've seen that none of the children actually slept a wink. They were all lying down and very restless. And because they're restless, they get, they get mischievous. And it's constantly the aid uh, uh, threatening them uh, to sleep with the, otherwise she's going to smack them or whatever. So that was the activity that was happening. If that could be a nice story time to put them to sleep, that would be a better approach is what uh, we thought. So yeah, with that, I thank you for this opportunity. I'm so sorry about my throat, yeah. Thank you, Silvia. Our next presenter is um, Mustafa. Would you like to share your slides, Mustafa? Can you see my slide? Yes. Thank you very much. I will... Uh focus in uh, what we are doing in uh, Kathleen. Uh, but uh, to introduce my presentation, I will remember uh, uh, in Senegal, the gross preschool annual work rate is about uh, 18%, but uh, this uh, percentage mask uh, regional disparity with uh, oscillating between uh, five to 40%. Kathleen, uh, the, the district where the, the study is uh, doing is the lowest per school, has the lowest per school on the right. In Senegal and in Kathleen, uh, particularly in Kathleen, there are uh, public per school and private per school. In Kathleen, most of the per school are public. About uh, 91% of uh, per school are public. Are public. And the, the, the language used is uh, can differ between per school. In formal per school, the language is French and local in Wolof. But uh, in French Arabic per school, uh, they use French Arabic and Wolof. Uh, in Quran school, only the Arabic and Wolof uh, are used to, to teach. Are used to teach. Another particularity of Quran school. I, Mustafa, I'm sorry. Are you trying? The, the slides are not moving. So we are still on the first slide. OK. I will uh... now we stop seeing your um, there. Yeah, that's great. Can you see the moving? Yes, now we are on the Quranic preschool. If you could just go to presenter mode so we can see it big in the it's okay. Yeah, we can we can see it. The Quranic okay. free school. Yeah. The Quran Okay. And uh, another particular of Quranic school is children are as from two to 13 years and uh, an estimated uh, children of formal school and elementary school go to no to corona school after normal school hours and during the school holiday most of the the educator uh, who, 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 who teach in public school are uh, graduates it's not the same in the pri private school 
where, where only 15% of uh, educator were trained. We, we did uh, a pilot study between uh, 4 to 11 June and the mine start in December. Uh, when we, we were in a uh, cafe, the first step is to to set up a training to, with the uh, investigator, with the uh, enumerator, email tool to reinforce the partnership with preschool administration, teacher and parents association. And during this period, we implement the, the, the melee. Uh, two preschool were selected. The first, Bethesda, is a private school, but uh, the second, Dar, is a coronary school. We visited uh, the, the selected school during two days, and uh, we, we set up uh, four group of two enumerators, and each group is two class. After that, uh, the enumerators uh, were uh, had meeting and uh, and uh, uh, and work to have a, a synthesis and a consensual report. Well, I'm sorry to, to interrupt you again. Uh, we cannot hear you very clearly. Probably your microphone is either not working or a bit close to your mouth. Is it better? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. No, the, this this picture. Uh, which uh, illustrate a meeting between uh, yeah. enumerator after the visit of the, the school. Uh, the, what I, I said, the, the two selected uh, preschool are Bethesda, a private school with religious orientation and uh, Ahlu Suna, which is a Quranic preschool. The main conclusion are, Class start at time. In formal school, like in a private school, the class is in the morning. But in a in Quranic school, the class uh, can be in the morning and hour in the evening. Uh, we notice that. Uh, in a Quranic school, the children, the number of children per class was greater than in a formal school. Uh, but the sex ratio was uh, almost equal. Uh, we, we notice uh, rarely children with special needs. Another conclusion is that in a formal school, all the activities are developed and teacher and children work to, to, to set up some activities which uh, can uh, develop fine motor, fine motor skill gross motor steel, expressive language, and, uh, and draw. It's not the same in Quranic school, uh, where the, the, the main activity is the, the recitation and uh, storage of Quran. The, the other activities like fine motor skill, gross motor skill, are not developed in Quranic school. When we, when we see the, the learning activity, we, uh, we notice they are in a private school, in a formal school, 
uh, children are better followed, they are uh, more positive interaction uh, than in a Quranic school. Uh, Thank you so much, uh, Mustafa. Just to to wrap up, one more minute, uh, okay. in order to to have space for the questions. Okay. Uh, a, 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 so, uh, the environment is uh, better. Another thing, the environment is better in a private school than in a public school than in Quran school. And I will illust show you some picture to illustrate the. the the condition. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all these very interesting presentations. I, I found really interesting how in India and Senegal, we just heard of examples of how different pedagogical approaches have been taken and, and how we can see those having an impact on, on the experiences and and learning of children. Um, is there any questions or comments for any of our presenters? Now is the time for, for this audience to... We have a few questions in the Q&A box. Yeah. If you want to... So the first one says, I just heard child to child mentioned. I'm not sure whether it was a generic or a reference to our organization. Uh, it has big, been big in India. Is, is child to child, Sylvia, something that you would like to, to talk about? Uh, <clears throat> yeah. uh, I, I don't know about that. I think it was made in a generic mention and uh, not about any particular organization, I'm yeah. afraid. Yeah. Thank you. The second question, um, I don't know who could address it. So let, let's have a go. It says, uh, did you see any opportunities to introduce STEM-based learning activities? Were there instances where some settings use STEM-informed approaches? So in India or Senegal? And then, then there's a follow-up question by, by the same person, by Sheila, that says, um, regarding the Mele tool, did you experience any challenges while using it? Um. <clears throat> yeah, Bunny, do you want me to answer that? Yeah. Yeah, and per perhaps clarify that what we are presenting now is the validation of the tool, the right. pilot. Um, so we learn from, from that process for, for the main cohort study. Uh, the Mele is a very um, easy to use and uh, uh, simple tool. Uh, it, it is time consuming, but uh, otherwise a very simple tool and it is very generic. So the adaptations that we also made to the tool are uh, very minimal. Just a couple of activities, like for instance, our Anganwadis do not cater to special uh, children, children with uh, special needs. So there was one question on that. So that was redundant for us. So that was eliminated. And the toilets, like, you know, our uh, settings are different uh, so like child size toilets that's not uh, normal here so we changed it to uh, uh, things like is the water facility there and um, uh, are they using the toilets to that level we had to change so very minor and these are the only couple of items that we had to change otherwise the tool is uh, easy to use and in fact I can add here that we had some conversations with the people from the department about using this melee in uh, uh, future to kind of uh, um, give them an evaluation of how the centers are functioning so we had that discussion as well and uh, most of them were very appreciative of it and uh, said it would be nice to use and uh, they didn't want to do it themselves. They wanted a third party to use the melee and uh, feedback so that you know there is uh, improvement. So it's, it's a, it seems to be an easy tool to use as of now, yeah. 
Thank you so much. Is there something, Lynn, that you would like to add in terms of uh, this, what we call the core melee and the, the specific versions? Yes, thank you very much. And thank you, Sylvia um, and Bernie. Um, and I think what I would like to just add is that I think what we did as a team was make sure that we did a very took a very systematic approach to look at the melee in terms of validating, um, adapting it, um, and making sure that the tool is very much context specific and relevant for, for each country. Um, and you know, country teams were excellent in, in coming together and going through each item each area of the melee tool. So we had extensive workshops and discussions on it. What we did aim for, um, and Bernie and Jessica, you know, and colleagues can also um, jump in here, is, is a kind of 80%, um, you know, making sure that 80% of the tool um, is consistent across, because that was very important, but also recognizing the importance of making sure that it reflects the relevant educational context, that there were some adjustments within each country. To give another example, for instance, we do know in some of the informal settings, but also the Quranic schools, faith-based settings, um, we, we, you know, religious activities, for instance, was very important. And of course, we've got another um, team of colleagues in Indonesia who are also using the tool. So we adapted um, some of these to the, 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 the tools um, to Mele um, as we were piloting it. And that was very important. Thank you. There's, there's another question about um, the sustained, the, the, the developmental goals. Uh, the question from Matilda is that, is, is, is there any information from Africa? My name is Matilda from Ghana. I'm a co-founder of Dev Goals Africa, a nonprofit centered on promoting CDGs in Africa by giving these stories visibility. And well, yes, I mean, our work with, with Mustafa, uh, what he was presenting is very important, how Mele was adapted uh, to an African context. And we, uh, my colleague Jessica uh, just um, posted our, the, the website of our project in the uh, chat, because uh, there are more information about, um, engagement and all the work we are we have been doing with uh, our country leads uh, and the policy makers and other very important stakeholders so it will be really interesting for to look at uh, at the website in terms of all all that development as well she says i would really love to write a story about it especially in africa yeah we please get in touch we we are very delightful of that and uh, we are also in in the process of publishing a blog about this work so uh, it would be also good if Jessica if you type uh, the the that that information in the in the chat is there more comments or questions so I put in the chat uh, our web page or still on the UCL website where so we update it with the hyperlink to all the resources we're creating so it's like the master web page so every time there is a new blog or um, we will also release a podcast soon you will see it on this web page thank you and Julie has helpfully also send the link to to uh, our first blog thank you Julie We should perhaps also say that if anybody wants to uh, see the papers and they can't access them in their journals in their countries, please do contact us and we can send you a PDF copy of the paper, papers as they're published. That's great. Thank you, Julie. Have we got questions that you want to ask live, please raise your hand and we're going to give you permission to speak. If there are no more questions, I think we can wrap up and uh, yeah, I'll leave it to you. Yes. yes, is there a last comment from presenters or the team that would like to I just want to say thank you for, for your presentations. Um, I think it's invaluable when we can see uh, the reflections of, for example, coming from Senegal and from India in terms of how 
the settings look like and what importance education and cognition can make to improve the, the, the life experiences and learning of, of these teachers and uh, students. So it, it was really, really interesting to see through that adaptation of Mele, how those differences come to the front. Um, and it's, it's really important in, in the process of, of this project. So thank you so much for, for that. And for the hub, to, from Alicia Gasco for all the organization of, of this. Uh, we, we felt very supported as a one, we are one of the, of the streams, one of the work streams, and there are many others, but with the central hub uh, support, we also feel we can improve our work and, and communicate it. So thank, thank you so much for uh, hosting us today. Thank you, Bernie. Thank you, everyone. So thank you very much, everyone. It was a great pleasure to have you here. Thank to the Education and Cognition Workstream. This was really good. And uh, thank you for your time, for the presentation and the effort you put into this. And uh, I put in the, in the chat uh, uh, the, the link to subscribe to our newsletter to get to know about our events and webinars. Uh, and thank you very much for being here. And uh, I'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye.